Welcome to part two of my interview with New Testament scholar and historian, Professor Ben Witherington. A recent book of Witherington's takes money as its subject in the wake of the global financial crisis. So we talked about money and what the ancient texts of the New Testament have to say about it. It's fair to say that observers of the Christian church might have reason to feel perplexed about what a truly Christian approach might be. Well, Ben Witherington helps to clear up some of the confusion. Your most recent book was about money, yep. uh, written in the wake of the 2008 global financial crisis. That crisis hit a lot harder in the US than it did here in Australia. What was it like there? Well, I can tell you what it was like at my school. We lost a lot of faculty, we lost staff, we lost our um, scholarship support account. Uh, we gave back some of our salary, we gave back some of our pension. Um, we lost some of our health care. Uh, it was a direct, drastic, and clear. And I, I lost a bunch of friends that I worked with. You know, so um, it was it was very clear. But and it was even worse for a lot of people who simply lost work altogether. You know, the last several years, the last two plus years, we've been sort of crawling out of a hole and and trying not to dig another one. You know, and it's it's been it's been tough going on. Christians and non-Christians alike, it's, and it still is. There's, you know, there's in some of the uh, major in industrial areas in America, you've got 15% unemployment or more. So it's, it's been hard times. Do times like this sharpen spiritual questions for people? Oh, of course, of course, because you know, if you place your security in money and your stocks and your bonds and your house and your car and all of that, and all of that can be taken away in an instant, then you realize how ephemeral it really is to place your ultimate security in those kinds of things. So what it's done is made people a lot less certain about how secure I can, how I can secure my life for myself or whether it's even possible to do that. And that, that opens up uh, an avenue or a door for all kinds of spiritual discussions about where shall I find my ultimate security. Sometimes people could get the impression that Christianity is anti-wealth, that you somehow need to walk around in an uncomfortable, itchy sack. And another impression might be that it's somehow tied to wealth. Which is it? Uh, I'd say it's neither A nor B. Um, on the one hand, it's certainly true that everything God has made is good, and God may well bless us with some of the material things that he's made in various ways. But the issue is not whether it's a good gift from God. The issue is what do you do with what God's given you? What, what I like to say about that issue, the most fundamental thing I want to say about that is the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Therefore, neither you nor I nor anybody else is an owner of any of this stuff. We didn't bring it with us coming into the world and even if you're buried with your pink Cadillac, you can't take it with you. So it's, it's God's stuff. It always was God's stuff. It's good. But the question is, what do you do with what you have? I mean, that's really the bottom line issue. And do you understand that you're called to be a steward of God's property? Uh, so, I mean, the, the theology of property in the Bible cuts against both a theology of private property, but it also cuts against all communistic theories of public property as well. I mean, if it's all God's property, then we're not owners. And if we're not owners, then we should be a whole lot possessive about God's property. It's a hard message to take into your being in this consumerist culture that we live in. It is. It's very, it's, it's very difficult. And so you have to constantly be de-enculturating yourself about these kinds of things. Because, you know, in the given day, according to one survey, the average Australian is going to see 40 commercials. Well, they're all trying to sell you something, of course. Right, so when you're constantly intellectually bombarded with all that, it's a it's a necessary conscious process of de-enculturation and simplification of your lifestyle to respond to that in a way that just doesn't amount to capitulation. What financial guidance might people get from the ancient texts of the New Testament? I'm thinking especially of economic priorities. Well, obviously, uh, what you should be working for is the necessities of life, not the luxuries on beyond the necessities. Um, and, you know, I encourage Christians, especially those that have gotten themselves into debt 
and are you know, in desperate financial straits, is that what they really need to do is look, a har at, look, look hard at what they've got and make up a list of necessities for them to live and luxury items. And, and then real ask yourself, where are you spending your money? Where is this money actually being sent? Are you spending it on necessities? Or are you spending it mostly on luxury items that you actually cannot afford? And so, you know, I'm, I'm asking them to go through a process of critical discernment about what they've got or what they want and, uh, and why. And ask them to ask the further question of, is this what God's highest and best would be for your life? Now, when you encourage people to simplify their lifestyle, simplify their lifestyle, then they actually have a time opportunity not only to get out of debt, but become really good stewards of God's property, um, loving their neighbor as their self, helping the poor, doing all kinds of things that the Bible encourages us to do. And you know, one of the things that's so interesting about simplifying your lifestyle is it's very freeing. I mean, if you don't have to take care of and protect and get security alarms for all this stuff, it really is a very freeing thing. If you, if you have your basic needs in life taken care of, uh, then there, there's not a lot more that you actually need in life. Uh, and, and it gives you an opportunity to be generous to others and be a blessing to others, which is what we're called to do with what we have, to be a blessing to others. How did the prosperity gospel develop? Uh, and has it affected the way Christianity is being perceived around the world? It has a, a track record and a history, and it really comes on the rise as, uh, with the wake of the Industrial Revolution. And it wasn't just a prosperity gospel, it was a health and wealth gospel. Those two things were seen as going together. And, and it even had something to do with the word of faith movement, that if you just trust and believe it, it will be so. I mean, if you just trust and believe it, you can be well. You can be wealthy. Uh, those kinds of uh, simplistic views of the power of faith, the power of prayer, and all of that sort of stuff. But you know, the Bible really doesn't encourage us to think that way at all. I mean, if you think, for example, of some of the great Christians in human history, many of them had serious health problems. This wasn't because they had a lack of faith. And many of them lived in poverty, and not by choice, not by choice. I mean, there are those like St. Francis who chose poverty in an order of poverty. That's a whole different ballgame. I mean, some of the, the most profound, important Christians, even in the 20th century, like Mother Teresa, were poor, you know, monetarily poor, physically poor. Uh, so, you know, I don't think there is any clear correlation between wonderful health. I mean, some of the most wicked people in the world are wonderfully healthy. This isn't because God blessed them, you know. And, and some of the m most uh, wicked people in the world are incredibly wealthy. This is not because God blessed them, you know. Uh, it's because they gave way to all kinds of temptations in life. So you see, it's, it's not an unvariegated good, health and wealth. Uh, you have to ask the critical question, um, is this a blessing for God? Or is this in my life of temptation to be uh, led away from God by his creation, by parts of his creation, you know. Um, where do you place your ultimate security?